Hello to everyone, and thank you for coming here. Um, I hope not to bore you too much. Uh, some of you might even say, oh, no, another talk about the pandemic. We don't want to hear about the pandemic anymore. Okay. Unfortunately, the pandemic is still a reality, it still kill uh, lots of people. And uh, I was hoping that we could learn something from the pandemic. Yet, I'm a bit disappointed. Let's see why. Um, first of all, I will talk about how we manage the pandemic globally, but also um, making some comparison between what I call failed states and virtuous countries. Then I will talk about the ecological crisis, so linking with the presentation we, you heard this morning, and how the pandemic is actually linked to the ecological crisis. And then I will talk about economics. I'm sorry, I have to. <laughs> because uh, one of the most important determinant of both pandemics, risk factors, and the ecological crisis has to do with ec economics. Um, and see how we can overcome this. Uh, so, um, this is the number of people who died because of COVID-19. And in Italian TVs, I remember uh, during the first weeks, um, there were people say, oh, did they die with COVID or due to COVID? Like to say, oh, this is an overestimation of the death toll. Uh-uh. This is an underestimation of the death toll by a factor of three or four. So the actual number of death, the pandemics, is three or four times higher than the official statistics for a variety of reasons of epidemiology data. And just to put things in perspective, in Italy, we had more death um, during the worst year of the pandemic crisis than during uh, the last year of World War II. And um, we, hear, we heard that the pandemic is over. But guess what? 60 million people are living with long COVID. So the long-term effect of the pandemic. So it, the consequences have been really concerning um, one of the most neglected uh, effects of the pandemic on mental health is the loss of parents, caregivers, and the trauma that all these kids had to endure because of the pandemic. Um, and of course, social relationships have been suffering. We have been told for years to surround ourselves with positive people, and then during the pandemic, we had to stay away from them. Um, so when I tackled this problem, I gave a TED talk on this, and I'm writing a book uh, on this that will be published next year. Um, I started wondering uh, how many lives out of these 27 million people could we save? And could we really do better? For some people, governments have done all their, or they could to save lives. Others say that well, uh, it was useless to do all these prevention interventions. Who is right? Um, in defense of those who say that lockdowns were useless, <laughs> are we really sure that the best way to reduce mortality is to lock wife and husband for a month? Okay. Um, and also, this is a very tricky and difficult uh, research question because there are so many variables that can explain why some countries at higher mortality rates than others. Mean age, uh, population density, geographic location, the presence of chronic diseases that were risk factors for um, the pandemic death. And uh, however, um, there is substantial evidence that some countries did very well in managing the pandemic and other countries that failed. So Italy is a failed state <laughs> from a prevention point of view. And so the United States and the United Kingdom. But Australia, South Korea, New Zealand, Japan, Vietnam, and Singapore are examples of virtuous countries. They adopted strong prevention strategies and saved lives on a large scale. 
Um, let's see. Um, I've tried to summarize the major errors, I call them lethal errors, that uh, distinguish those countries who have done well in the pandemic from those who have failed. Uh, lack of preparation, disinformation, medicalization, laissez-faire the virus approach and social inequities. Uh, this is not working well. Okay, so in Italy, for example, the pandemic plan was not up upgraded for 14 years, and then they decided to shut down the epidemiological service a few years before the outbreak of the pandemic. Great timing, wow. Um, but other countries were not prepared. A, a second problem was misinformation. Have you heard about fake news during the pandemic? Oh, wow. Um, we heard it that masks were useless, the virus was clinically dead, uh, the emergency was over for even the first few months of the pandemic. It's little more than a flu. Um, vaccines are ineffective and there is a cure for COVID, but they are hiding it. Um, but the climax of fake news was provided by Donald Trump, who thought could cure COVID with a disinfectant. Um, a third problem was to mistake a global health crisis for a medical problem. But isn't the COVID pandemic a medical problem? Yes or no? More importantly, is a public health problem. So it must be tackled with prevention efforts at the community level, not just through virology or clinical specialist, right? Um, Laissez-faire the virus approach. Uh, what do I mean? Okay, during the first months of the pandemic, I heard the economists and even politicians say, um, some elderly people will have to die. Because we cannot stop the productive efforts of the country. And also because some experts thought that we could reach the herd immunity, which as this editorial in Nature shows, was a false promise. Guess what? Those countries who tried to protect the economy by letting the virus go had the worst economic outcomes. Oh, good job. Very well done. They had not only the worst public health outcomes, but also the worst economic outcomes. And um, um, I have this point. And um, social inequities. When we heard, when we saw Donald Trump, uh, Boris Johnson, or Silvio Berlusconi got they, they got infected, we thought, oh, this this virus is democratic. Said a philosopher. Oh no, it's not democratic. It's very unjust. And uh, the poor, the least educated, manual workers, key workers were far more affected in terms of mortality, uh, hospitalization, and infection. Um, so three vital actions, not five, sorry. Prevent, immunize, and support. Uh, first of all, those countries who reduce mortality rates have done best in testing, tracing, and isolating the infected. And they use a strong uh, um, epidemiological systems to do what? To avoid lockdowns, for example. Why? Well, if you have a very good epidemiological system, instead of shutting down the entire country, you just target the hotspots of the pandemic, right? And eventually, you apply those prevention efforts in the most dangerous areas. Um, but uh, um, the coming of Omicron variants um, have turned this game into a almost a losing battle. Why? Omicron is almost unstoppable, almost unpreventable. We'll see later um, that we should uh, um, thank those countries who have let the virus go, because the best way to create new variants like Omicron is to play Russian roulette with the virus. 
So you let the virus go until you find an, um, a variant that becomes uh, unpreventable. It sounds a bit like um, the siege of Kaffa, uh, defended by the Genoese, when the Mongols used to catapult uh, her plague-infected corpus, corpses over the walls of the city to spread the infections. So uh, letting the virus go is a good idea. Um, immunize. We heard uh, that uh, vaccines have been very important for this uh, pandemic. And indeed, we have plenty of evidence that they save lives on a large scale. Uh, an example, look at Texas, one of the states that have vaccinated the least. They had a far higher mortality rate than other states in the US. Um, I'm trying to find out the best way. But uh, the vaccination campaign was, was not uh, very uh, inclusive. Most African countries have not had a any access to the vaccines. Why? Because rich countries didn't want to um, basically, um, yeah, didn't want to um, abolish the patent rights that uh, could have been used um, or could, be, could have uh, uh, allowed poor countries to use generic drugs and uh, have vaccines for free. Um, I'm trying to understand why this is not working. And support. The pandemic should have taught us that, um, yeah, if you, tra if you test and trace and then you don't support, people would have to isolate. These people will not isolate. Why? Because they don't have the economic chance to do it. Homeless people, key workers, people who have who had to uh, work to eat. So um, the other question I ask myself, how do we prevent the next pandemic since uh, we got this one? And um, I keep having problems with this. Um, you heard about the origin of the pandemic. There are two schools of thought. One is the natural origin of the pandemic, and the other one is the lab leak. Um, on the lab leak, um, coming from the Institute of Virology, actually there is no evidence, uh, even though we should not rule out this possibility. And, um, but there is evidence that to, around the one market in Wuhan, we found uh, the hot spots and, uh, and the first few cases of, of COVID-19 pandemic uh, around there. And also we must... Um, um, Remember that um, these type of markets are, are very dangerous from an epidemiological point of view. I call them the horror markets. How they treat animals uh, is directly related to the epidemiological risk uh, we carry on. But 75% of uh, traded wild animals, so 75% of pandemics that occurred in the last 20, 30 years are due to trade wild animals. So, uh, the WHO uh, created a team to investigate the origin of the pandemic, and they say, okay, there are two major culprits for the pandemic. One is the bat. <laughs> Why? Because they, are, they can fly, they are gregarious, they possess a unique tolerance for virus. And the second one uh, we'll see later is the pangolin. So, some people have uh, <laughs> um, proposed, don't kill them all. Right? Oh, because um, we heard from researchers that if you increase biodiversity, you actually increase the risk of pandemics. You don't decrease it. And uh, the second culprit for the COVID-19 virus is the pangolin, one of the most uh, illegally traded wild animals. Uh, it's such a cute animal. Um, and this idea that we should blame animals for the pandemic really made me, um, yeah, upset. Uh, because um, uh, when we say the COVID-19 virus has a natural origin, I disagree. It has a man-made origin. Let's see why. 
um, we depicted COVID-19 as a black swan, a surprising event, unpredictable, unpreventable. Oh, well, <laughs> let's read the David in 2013. There is no reason to believe that AIDS will remain the only global disaster of our time caused by a strange microbe that jumped out of an animal. Some well-informed Cassandra even talks about the next big event as an inevitable fact. Will it be caused by a virus? Will it manifest itself in a rainforest or in a city market in South China? <laughs> um, what are the factors that increase pandemic risk? They are all man-made. They have nothing to do with the pangolin. They have nothing to do with the bat. Increase use and exploitation of wildlife, deforestation, increasing demand for animal protein, unsustainable agricultural intensification, unsustainable use of natural resources, travel, globalization, transportation, and climate change. So hotspots for deforestation are also hotspots for pandemics. The more deforestation, the more pandemics. And why do engage in so much deforestation? Because we convert lands for animal production intensive. So industrialized animal production is associated with industrialized production of pathogens, as Robert Wallace here shows. And the two pandemic are related because, um, for example, one pandemic uh, of African swine flu in China has shifted consumption uh, towards uh, wild animals, and this increase of consumption of wild animals in China might be the key culprit for the pandemic, right? Um, so what do they have in common, these uh, two crises? First of all, we show that climate change uh, is associated with pandemics. 58% of the infectious diseases already faced by humanity around the world were at some point aggravated by climate risk. And also, uh, we, um, we have to think about the connections in terms of what are the key determinants of both climate change and pandemics. As you can see from here, all these factors, excessive consumption, animal protein, deforestation, urbanization, demographic explosion, loss of biodiversity, international traveling, industrialized of animal production, they both cause CO2 emissions and pandemic risk. So we must use a holistic approach to face this crisis. Otherwise, uh, we may not win this battle. We will be exposed to more pandemics and climate change. Um, climate change is becoming more and more threatening. You heard it from all sorts of talks. We are probably um, at the point where, unless we really adopt drastic policies, we may pass the so-called tipping points. Tipping points are, are, are um, increases, exponential increases of certain type of phenomena that uh, are not amenable to uh, change in the future. So we are talking about potentially irreversible impacts um, in the ecosystem. And uh, this is not just exposure to heat waves or extreme events like a flood or droughts. This is an existential risk. And for existential risk, we mean the risk of collapse of civilization or even human extinction. So these two guys published a paper on the proceeding of National Academy of Science. Um, they show that we have one in 20 chance to risk um, an existential outcome. And they put it really eloquently. Um, it is equivalent to a one in 20 chance the plane you are about to board will crash. We will never get on that plane with a one in 20 chance of it coming down. So why are we willing to send our children and grandchildren to that plane? Extinction Rebellion 101. Um, 
I argue that behind these two crises, there is what I call the neoliberal variant of capitalism. So neoliberalism, it's a, an economic theory and also an ideology. Um, and I explain later uh, what it is. Uh, but um, it's very interesting when I talk to economists, uh, I get uh, unwelcome <laughs> mostly about these talks. Um, quoting an historian who published a paper called The Political Movement that Dare Not to Speak, uh, its own name. Um, he says, I have experienced a range of odd reactions to my work anytime I talk about neoliberalism. Um, Either they say that neoliberalism is just an illusion of my brain, or that is too unspecific to be treated as a serious academic term. Okay, so do you remember that in 1989 there was the fall of the wall? And uh, do you remember that Reagan and Thatcher pushed for policies that wanted more markets, more markets, more markets, less state? Less state, less state. Why? Because um, the states are interfering against the magic of the market. The markets should be left free because they are self-regulating. Ronald Reagan, that Gore Vidal called the acting president, was famous for these jokes. And one of them was uh, the most nine fear words in the English language the government, I'm here to help. Um, and also um, the famous mantra by um, Lady Thatcher, there is no alternative. We tried everything, so neoliberalism is the only thing we can afford uh, for an economic system. I think that unless we find an alternative, um, I hope. And also they depicted neoliberalism as the end of history, in a, like a, in a celebration. Uh, so what I mean for neoliberalism is called in so many terms and names the Washington Consensus, laissez-faire economics, turbo capitalism, shock therapy, structural adjustment policies, even China adopted neoliberalism in certain areas. It's the idea of deregulation, privatization, financialization, um, cuts to government expenditure and austerity, and the idea that markets should be uh, left free to operate without distortion. And how does it happen that these policies may eventually, may eventually favor conditions that cause both climate change and pandemics? Oh, take a look at trade liberalization policies. Uh, increases deforestation, uh, in increases intensification of animal farming and land grabbing. So small farmers, uh, are losing their lands because it must be devoted for export promotion. Because the, the neoliberal project wants everybody to export their own uh, products. And um, so in this paper, for example, they show how free trade agreements are associated with increase of deforestation. And um, how this is how Andreas Malm put it. If it were not for the economy assailing the wild, encroaching upon it, tearing it to it, chopping it up, destroying it with a zeal bordering on lust for extermination, these pandemics would not happen. These pathogens will not come leaping towards us. They will be secure among their natural hosts. Where? In the forest. The forest has been cutting for years. Um, because of the economic efficiency. Also, we have uh, financial practices and financial industries uh, investing in land grabbing and, uh, and agriculture. And um, as uh, Rob Wallace put it, um, if we pay attention to the entities that finance deforestation, we should consider international financial center as hotspots for pandemics, he said. Um, should uh, rename uh, the pandemics according to their political, economic causes. Um, Rob Wallace lost his job, by the way, because of his stance against these topics. And here has been featured by the Nation magazine as the un unemployed epidemiologist who predicted the pandemic. Um, so 
I'm wrapping up. I've been too long and too boring. Okay, so we need a new socioeconomic system. We cannot just afford individual ecological changes. Um, we may want to adopt those changes, but unless you change the system, the climate change uh, crisis will not be won. Uh, so we need regulations on forests. Uh, we need to deal with um, the idea and, uh, that agriculture should be dominated by big corporations. That's exactly the opposite of what we do. Uh, we should stop all this stuff. And we should tackle the climate change crisis with much more radical and profound policies, not just behaviors, not just behaviors. So, you know that in order to really um, try to avoid the point of no return or the tipping points of climate change, we must drastically reduce CO2 emissions. But guess what? The only historical times when we managed to reduce carbon emissions was when? COVID-19. <laughs> okay. The only time where we really managed to reduce carbon emissions globally was due to the pandemic, due to the, the pandemic okay? I'm from Venice. And I don't know if you've been, okay, okay. You know the city, right? <laughs> the small disappearing city with more tourists than residents. Okay, so the first time they saw a dolphin in the Grand Canal was a fake. But then it was really, saw it. it was here, we saw it. The real one. Um, so, uh, when we uh, experience those changes during the pandemic, we wonder, maybe uh, we should learn something out of this crisis and make this crisis um, giving us a chance to reset this system and learn something new. Um, of course, the pessimists say, the only thing you learn in history is that you don't learn anything from history, right? But uh, um, I think um, the idea of coming back to normal should be challenged by the fact that the normal <laughs> was a bit abnormal. So um, here I have a challenge for all of us. Um, I don't know if you ever heard the term economicism. Oh. Such a jargon, buzzword, yeah. But it's the idea that social goals are incorporated and subjugated to the economic system instead of the economic system to the social goals. So we have a society that prioritizes the economy over the well-being of people. No wonder we are facing so many crises. We should change this, this entire approach. And uh, for how long have you been knowing this? Oh, Karl Polanyi published a book like more than half a century ago on this, right? And yet we have uh, established opinion leaders in society that um, have very funny ideas. And it is really uh, in economic schools that infinite growth in economic terms, is possible in a finite planet, which is sort of a myth uh, comparable to a religion. Um, here, Lawrence Summers, former chief economist of the World Bank, former US Secretary Treasury to both the Obama and the Clinton administration, and the former president of Harvard University. So we are talking about a top, super, super top individual that is um, um, forward-looking in terms of 
um, economic ideas, there are no limits to the carrying capacity of the Earth that are likely to bind any time in the foreseeable future. There is not a risk of an apocalypse. The idea we should put limits on growth because of some natural limit is a profound error. Oh, a profound error. Even when dealing with the climate crisis, during the negotiation of the Paris United Nations Climate Conference, a leaked internal EU document revealed that European governments have instructed their representatives to oppose any discussion or measure to combat climate change that may be a restriction on international trade. International trade is like God. Unless we challenge this religion, we don't go anywhere with our behaviors. So, it's one of my last slides. Um, in this editorial in The Guardian, um, a professor of climate strategy from the Nero um, entitled, um, it, it didn't entitle because he was the editor, it is profitable to let the world go to hell. Uh, so unless we, we overcome this economicism and also short-termism that prioritize profit, private profit over short-term than long-term well-being, we don't go anywhere. Um, so we need an emergency exit out of these uh, economic models. Um, I don't know if you heard this phrase, it's famous among sociologists and philosophers. Uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of neoliberalism. I think we should uh, really um, go beyond the idea that we can fight climate change as individuals. And that's another of the um, illusions in the neoliberal society. We cannot fight climate change as individuals. We can fight climate change if we overthrow the structures of power and the economic models that push for these policies. Okay. So, don't despair. <laughs> like every economic paradigm, every political theory, um, and every structure of thought um, is not a monolithic system, neoliberalism. Uh, like uh, Leonard Cohen, famous musician, put it, there is a crack in everything, and that's how gets in. So, thank you for <laughs> for listening. Um, I think I think I hope I'm on time. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. If you have questions, please raise your hands. Okay, the last. I can send you all the slides you want. Yeah, just write me, I will send you everything. There is no copyright, I don't care. Like, <laughs> so, I can song too by Leonard Cohen. <laughs> Darf ich meine Frage auf Deutsch stellen? Ist jemand, der gut Englisch kann und für mich über Alex kannst du übersetzen? Um, okay. <laughs> uh, zero, zero, <laughs> zero. Yeah, I don't. Want, uh, yeah, if, if you can translate it for yes. me. Yes, okay. Danke für Ihren Vortrag. Ich finde den sehr wichtig. Ich habe gerade in dem vorhergehenden Vortrag ähm, ähm, auch den Gedanken gehabt äh, und ihr, die Frage an den Referenten gestellt, ob es nicht Zeit wäre, als äh, Gegenansatz gegen den äh, Leo, neoliberalistischen Kapital, Kapitalismus ähm, auch mal an den Verzicht zu denken, ähm, das weniger, äh, weniger Wachstum. Vielleicht willst du das erstmal übersetzen und dann geht es weiter. Ja. Uh, so, she's not done yet. I'm going to translate this first part. So, she's saying first, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. And uh, she has a question concerning something that she also asked in the first session, which was that um, 
maybe we would uh, how about thinking more about actually like uh, not growing more and more getting out of this growth paradigm but thinking more about more, uh, doing and working and producing less thank you Alex. Ähm, einige Zeit äh, vorher, äh, vor einigen Monaten, habe ich ähm, das deutsche Buch gelesen von Ulrike Herrmann. Möglicherweise kennen Sie das, das Ende des Kapitalismus. Ich finde, das ist ein sehr kluges Buch und Ulrike Herrmann stellt in diesem Buch ähm, untersucht in diesem Buch ganz viele ähm, Wirtschaftszweige, den Energiezweig, Klima, ähm, äh, Bauen, Verkehr und so weiter und sie stellt fest, dass wir eigentlich ähm, all das, was wir tun, nur vor dem Hintergrund der Folie des Wirtschaftswachstums tun und dass wir damit eigentlich die Kipppunkte längst überschritten haben. Ähm, vielleicht erstmal so. Uh -huh. <lacht> um. Yes, yeah, so she's talking about a book that she read from an author called Ulrike Herrmann, which is called The End of Capitalism. And she, uh, Ulrike Herrmann in this book says that uh, this growth mentality is basically in every part of our society. Yeah. Um, um, was glauben Sie, sie schlägt, uh, sie schlägt vor, dass die Politik eigentlich Maßnahmen ergreifen müsste und, denkt, uh, und bringt das historische Beispiel von Großbritannien während des Zweiten Weltkriegs an. Die, die britische Regierung unter Churchill hat ähm, Verzicht für alle verordnet. Und die Menschen haben das alle mitgetragen. Und ich denke, solange die Wirtschaft darauf baut, dass der Einzelne verzichtet und das in die Hände des Einzelnen geht, wird es vielleicht nicht klappen. Was halten Sie davon, wenn die Regierungen Verzicht für alle verordnen? So the question is about uh, from the book that she's proposing from Churchill in World War II that he was uh, um, well mandating uh, consuming less for everybody and that we, she's proposing that we need uh, political action from governments that it's going to be socially equal that everybody has to consume less. What do you think about this? Um, these are real points and thank you for, for this. I will try to be brief not to... Um, um, use the time of other speakers, but uh, degrowth, uh, there is a, a huge movement on degrowth. It doesn't need to be uh, degrowth per se, uh, because we are not uh, aiming at degrowth. We are aiming a stay beyond the limits of the ecosystem. And uh, if we can do that by growing, we are fine, but we cannot do it. I, I show it. Only the COVID-19 crisis has allowed us to reduce carbon emissions globally. So we need to find one way to, um, even for some years, to adopt some degrowth path. Um, but some people say, oh, uh, this will make uh, a population suffer. Oh, no. You have to uh, adopt a degrowth strategy together with redistribution policies. Um, policies that provide a job for everyone and a welfare system so you don't have to leave anyone behind. And uh, the example of World War II, I guess, right? It's a very, very uh, telling, revealing example. Okay, see, yeah. Uh, you, you know that... World War II, um, full employment job. <laughs> Everybody was included in the economic system during the war. Everybody got a job. Even the most destitute, homeless, people in society. Why? Because they converted the economic system uh, to fight the enemy. Well, this is a worse enemy than Hitler, because it can cost our, our survival. So I completely agree with you. Uh, we should adopt like a, a policies for an emergency. And, uh, but it doesn't seem to me that uh, politicians, economists, and major opinion leaders are really understanding the gravity of the situation. Guess what? Children, activists, have understood the problem much better than us. <laughs>